the soldiers are well trained, they're well motivated, they're well led. The Corps right now is postured to do both missions at Golby but also regionally to support General Brooks setting the theater in the Pacific. So my initial assessment after doing our commander's conference last week is we're on the right path as we move the Corps forward. First Corps has expanded its footprint in terms of units. How? Why? It's a mission command function where the Corps right now has taken mission command of the 7th Infantry Division, the 593rd Expeditionary Sustainment Command, the 25th Infantry Division, the brigades, the combat brigades that are part of the United States Army Alaska, and then also 1st Corps forward in Japan. So what this gives us now is a mission command headquarters over subordinate units that enhances their readiness, specifically their training readiness, enhances their readiness for operations worldwide. More importantly, it provides that core headquarters, again, as I said earlier, that helps General Brooks set that theater in the Pacific, which is so important now for our mission as the only core that's assigned to a combatant commander. You have well over 50,000 soldiers under your command. What's your primary focus? Well, the primary focus is readiness. The primary focus is, is training readiness. Yeah, I see the Keep it on that window right there. And being able, with the resources we have, to provide the best capable, the best equipped, the best trained soldiers so that we can answer any kind of mission that we're given. And right now, as you know, we have forces both in the Middle East that are globally responsive, and we also have forces that are regionally engaged in the Pacific. The rotation you're watching today, 1408 with 22 Striker Brigade Combat Team, they will be postured after this mission for Pacific Pathways 14, and we're very excited about that mission and that operation as they go to Malaysia, Indonesia, and end up in Japan for Orient Shield. But as I recall, the Pacific is fairly tropical. You're training here in the desert. I think the key is it's your training to be ready and then you adjust to the conditions that you're trained to. So our metal tasks, offense, defense, stability operations, and then from there we're prepared to do missions worldwide and we'll adjust to those conditions. And I think part of our ability to go to the Pacific will be to look at those conditions that we have to train under. As you know, we have units in Alaska, we have units in Hawaii, so we'll adjust to the conditions as required. The Pacific is a region that is home to some of the world's largest armies. Some are allies, some aren't. How does that translate to you at First Corps? I think our role here is to help General Brooks with phase zero operations with your theater security cooperation and building partner capacities. As you know, five of the seven treaty partners the United States has are in the Pacific. The largest armies in the world are in the Pacific. The majority of the Pacific has 54% of the world's population. So when you look at a land force, and you look at what a land force can do in terms of helping General Brooks set the theater, it's about helping achieve positional advantage, the ability to control land people and resources. It's about helping Admiral Locklear achieve access. It's about building that partner capacity to reassure our allies and also to make sure that we have these relationships built so as required, we can go in and conduct operations so that we can de-escalate. Because what we want to do in the Pacific is make sure that we do not have combat operations. We want to keep everything at a lower level. So de-escalation is so, so important in the Pacific. And that's why these relationships as we move forward, whether it's theater security cooperation or building partner capacity are so important. First Corps is expected to be globally responsive. And regionally engaged. With so many threats around the world that are constantly evolving, how do you know where to put your training focus? Our training focus is on our basic core competencies. Our basic core competencies based on our metal. We train our core competencies, we train on our metal tasks, and then we adjust those to the conditions and the security environment we're in. So for example, as we have missions in the Pacific right now for Pacific Pathways in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Japan, we're doing additional training to understand culture, understand requirements in those specific countries as we do those key operations in those countries. And that's in addition to the training that you're seeing here. What you're seeing here is training as that we leave this rotation, we are going to be at the highest level of training readiness as we come out of NTC. And that is key before we accept other missions. You speak about Pacific Pathways. What is this? Pacific Pathway is an operation where 2-2 Stryker will be out in the Pacific for about four months. We'll have one battalion, Stryker Battalion, do operations in Malaysia. We'll have one battalion do operations in Indonesia, and then they will coalesce in Japan for Operation Orient Shield. So this is designed, again, to do phase zero operations. It's designed to build partner capacity, theater security cooperation, train with our partners in the Pacific, and build those relationships operationally over time. And then what we'll do next year with Pacific Pathways is General Brooks will give us guidance on what he wants to accomplish in the Pacific with those certain countries, and that will lead us into Pathways 15 and then Pathways 16. So this is a chance based on country requirements and country needs to provide the right resources, the requisite capabilities with the countries in terms of the outcomes we want to achieve with our partners. How does this differ from what we've been doing? It's in addition to what we're doing now. It's, it's something that we have not done in the past. We're actually going to put capabilities forward of the dateline. 
for an extended period of time. And this provides a mutually supporting capability to General Brooks and Admiral Locklear in terms of what an Army land component can do. Now we have other capabilities to help set the theater besides brigade combat teams. We have sustainment capabilities. We have MP capabilities, fire support capabilities. All these capabilities help set and shape the theater. So again, if it's humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, we have requisite capabilities. If it's training professional militaries to help governance in a particular country, we have those capabilities. And they don't have to be large capabilities. They can be smaller capabilities that really allow us to help set and shape that theater for General Brooks. So does this mean that you'll be using a total Army force, Reserve, National Guard, active duty? Eventually I would see us moving to the total force and having a multi-compo solution set to this, and that's something we're looking at right now. Total force, and I'm glad you mentioned that, is so important because as the Army moves forward, we have to do this as a total force with our Compo 2, Compo 3 units. 7th Infantry Division has already done a conference with all the G3s in our area in Washington State, Idaho, and Oregon to bring the entire team together, and then we're doing a commander's conference to continue to facilitate that. The key with total force is to align their training schedules so that we can link their readiness to the training requirements that allow us to work together. Building partnership capacity is a goal. How do you go about doing this? You do it by building relationships and understanding the requirements that are needed in each country. So as you build capacity in a specific nation, what are their requirements? Do they need additional training on sustainment? Do they need additional training on IEDs? Do they need additional training in terms of marksmanship? Train their non-commissioned officer corps. That builds capacity within a military. And most of the militaries in these large countries are armies. And most of the CHODs, as you know, chief of defenses, are Army people. So by linking the Army to this and building that capacity, it allows an Army to grow, it allows an Army to be more professional, and that helps build stability and governance in these areas and these countries. Sir, what are the expectations of the multinational partners of us? I think the expectation is, is that we're good partners and we're good allies. Using the terrain. And that we reassure guys, our commitment to them, specifically our treaty partners. I think what we've seen here in the last couple of years is that we have been in the Pacific for the last couple of years, and there's a perception that we have not been. Well, the United States Army has been there now for many decades, and now it's just reassuring our partners, reassuring our friends and allies that the Army is committed to them, it's committed, again, to partnering with them, it's committed to their professional development and growth, and that we have a role to play in achieving access in the Pacific. And extended presence does this? Extended presence is part of what we need to do to reassure our allies that we are there for them. What are your expectations of them? My expectations of them is that they help us define the requirements they need. My expectations of them is that they provide uh, capabilities and resources to help our soldiers understand what they need to do to better them as a professional military. And my expectations of them is that they continue to partner with us and they also come here to train. Part of what we're doing here, you're seeing, is we have Koreans on the ground training right now. We have the Japanese that are coming here for Rising Thunder with 7th Infantry Division. So you're also seeing not just us going there, but you're seeing our partners come here to train in the United States. And there's this reciprocity that occurs between our countries as we build more professional, capable militaries that have partnership relationships that will help us in the future de-escalate conflict in the Pacific. Or, if necessary, in Korea, conduct anything that we're asked to do. Working with the Pacific is ambitious. It's expensive with uh, the budget cuts, the manpower cuts, how are you gonna manage? Right now we have the resources with the Budget Control Act to sustain our readiness, so I'm, I'm not concerned right now. Obviously the concern is, is post-16, but I think in the future is how do you define requirements? You know, with the limited resources that you have right now, is first of all we have to be trained and ready. After we're trained and ready, what are the requirements of what we want our military to do? And then looking at how you prioritize those requirements will be what's important in the future. So where do you see more focus, more emphasis in the days ahead? In the days ahead, I think what I've seen out here and what I'm very comfortable and happy with what they're doing here is how we're readjusting to combined arms maneuver training and how we're looking at what a brigade combat team does to look at all its enablers, how it synchronizes its enablers to shape the fight for its subordinate units. And what we're seeing out here is the ability to relook at how we do fire support, how we look at sustainment, how we relook at mission command from a brigade perspective, and building on some of those skills that have perhaps have been nascent in the last 10 years because of operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, and giving us more capability to do decisive action.